Sarah is going to kick us off. Yeah. Thank you so much to Josh and Chanel, um, to Root Cause Research Center and BLM Louisville and all the other groups involved. Um, and thank you for inviting us to have this conversation with you guys today. Um, my name is Tara Graziani. Um, I help run the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, which is a collective of researchers, storytellers, organizers, and tenants using data, maps, media, and storytelling to fight for tenants' rights and housing justice. Uh, Alana Eden uh, joins me today in um, presenting on behalf of the LA chapter of our project. Um, and we're also joined by Sasha of the Los Angeles Tenants Union, who introduced herself with the video. So today we want to start by proposing the question, what is housing justice? Um, or I think it's the next slide. We can go back to this one. Um, so what does justice for tenants mean? What would it mean if you, if we as tenants had control over our housing? This question and how we get there is what we'll be talking about today. So for us, housing justice means community control. It means tenant-centered organizing. It means housing security. It means housing justice as racial justice. It means the abolition of rent. It means safe housing. It means habitable housing. Uh, it means cop-free neighborhoods. It means that housing justice isn't just about the individual. It's about neighborhood justice. It's collective care. Um, and so we want to call you to share out thoughts in the chat on what housing justice means to you. Any words um, or feelings or thoughts that you that came up when hearing that question. And hopefully people will follow along in the chat. So to go back to the agenda slide, I want to talk through real quick what we'll talk about today. Um, we'll talk first about what it means to be a tenant and the power and balance between the rights that tenants have in this country and the rights that property owners have. We'll talk about what tenants are facing in California where we do our work um, with a focus on the fact that we have to talk about housing justice work as racial justice work. And then we'll move into talking about some of the avenues to change, focusing on organizing and movement building as where we're putting our energy. Um, so, and then Sasha from the Los Angeles Tenants Union uh, will be moving us into a tenant organizing 101 and talking about some of the recent campaigns that the Tenants Union has done in LA. Um, but before we get started, um, I want to ask, uh, share a little bit about um, who, who the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project is. Um, and so um, our work has many purposes, including documenting tenant experiences, building community power through data and mapping and the production of knowledge. Uh, through informing policy uh, and laying the groundwork for a radical vision for housing justice. Um, we do all of our work in partnership with tenants rights organizations and communities directly impacted by eviction, displacement, and gentrification. Um, and I just included a few of our projects that we're working on in LA. Um, we make interactive maps that track and illuminate patterns of eviction. We have our oral history project, which seeks to document tenant, tenants narrating their own experiences of living in LA. And we have a project looking into art washing, um, like galleries and other like fancy art institutions moving in and gentrifying the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. And many, many more, which we'll touch on as we go through this presentation. Um, but one thing that we believe to be important in all of our work, um, is that gentrification happens differently in different places. So, uh, and those nuances are important in a lot of ways, especially in organizing. So today we'll talk about the work that we're doing in LA and in California, but we hope that in the chat and in the Q&A and after today, that this will be a dialogue where we learn from you more about what's going on in Louisville because it may look the same in some ways, but it probably looks different in some ways too, and that's important to hold. Um, so um, we want to start by calling out that most of us on this call are probably tenants. Um, and we're giving this presentation primarily for the members of all the organizations who are hosting this call. So we want to start by talking about what it means to be a tenant. 
Um, in the Mapping Project's Oral History Project, we interviewed Sally, who is a member of the Tenants Union in the Northeast Local. And so I just want to start by playing a short clip from her um, on this topic. Oh, I don't think we can hear it. Oh, it's because you're, you're muted, Alana. Duh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. So just close it, close it out. Oh. Sorry. We all raised our kids, and then you went off and bought homes. My home. Yeah, that's where I live. That's where I raised my kids by myself when I got divorced. That's, you know, my whole life, my family. Yeah. Live there. I had seven siblings living in that building, and we all raised really? our kids. And then they went off and bought homes. That's the kind of owner. That's one of the owners around this neighborhood. And then when they pass, these are the people that come in like sharks and just want money. Years ago, it was people wanted owners wanted people to stay happy in where they lived, not feel like they had to leave. So Sally is talking about her experience in LA and. The narrative we hear from Sally is so different from what the mainstream narrative says, if they say anything at all about tenants, about people who don't own property um, in this country. Um, the typical narrative is that tenants are lazy, that they're transient, that they don't contribute to their communities, that they rent because they want to choose to move at any time, and therefore that they don't deserve control over what happens in their community. Um, but it goes deeper than this. Uh, we live in a country that's based in dispossession of taking land from indigenous peoples, a uh, country that then portioned this land into parcels, granted it exclusively to white men, and then built an entire legal structure that said only those who own land or property are full humans and are deserving members of society. So we also, um, on top of this, we live in a country where housing is a commodity meaning that it is valued as it can be bought and sold on the market rather than as a home and as a basic need. Um, this has a long and detailed history that I'm condensing into very short comments today. But since the Second World War, we've basically handed more and more control of our housing market over to private companies while we've radically cut funding and support for what we in the US call public housing or socialized housing, along with countless other forms of social support. Um, so this means that housing for landlords and developers is an investment. It's something to make a profit off of. And Alana will talk later about the fact that the legal system ensures this right to profit off of the housing that they own to property owners. But as we know, <laughs> for all of us, housing is actually a basic human need. Um, and this disconnect of incentives with a huge power imbalance towards those who own property is why we're seeing the violence of eviction, displacement, and homelessness in our cities and towns all across the country. So this all makes, uh, what I just described, makes up a very deep-seated common sense in our society um, that shows up in significant ways for tenants, especially along lines of race and class. So we wanna hold this history as we talk about organizing tenant power today because it's at the root of what we're up against. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Alana, who will talk about how some of this um, manifests and affects tenants today. Tara, so yeah, so um, the way that this plays out in our uh, conditions today that we live in is um, this disparity of power, this disparity of rights and legal recognition, um, it's heavily balanced toward landlords, even in um, California, which is often considered to be the state with the strongest tenant protections, which is like a scary thought, actually. Um, but so when we think about like, the scope of the rights afforded to tenants or the protections as they're called as well. Um, one is rent control. So in the sphere of rent, and we don't even have true rent control. We usually have rent stabilization, which is where um, the government will allow a range of rental increases, but the starting rent can be whatever they want. So there's still a lot of room for maneuvering for the landlord. Um, just cause are eviction protections, and this means that the landlord uh, must state 
a valid reason to evict someone. And this is considered a really important protection in the tenant rights world because otherwise the landlord could just evict with no reason at all. Um, but even this, like even this victory for us is still so limited and still explicitly allows a lot of evictions, um, including reasons that are explicitly not the tenant's fault. Um, tenants also have rights and protections around habitability. Um, the, it's sort of assumed that the landlord is supposed to provide good quality housing, safe and clean conditions. Um, but I think probably all of us have a sense of how far this is from reality. And certainly if you have ever tried to call an inspector to your place, you probably know that this is not enforced. Um, well at all. Um, so another area of rights and protections that tenants are meant to have is fair housing. And fair housing is um, part of the civil rights movement um, and it's meant to prohibit discrimination in housing. Um, the idea here, the base here is that it will ensure equal access to housing that you can afford. So this idea of um, being able to afford something, having the money for something as being like an allowable barrier to housing that, oh, sure, like certain aspects of your identity are not an acceptable barrier to accessing housing, but money is. So this is still really confined in this liberal capitalist imagination um, that doesn't respond to basic needs. So I just want people to think about like the limitations of these of this legal framework for tenants. And then when it comes to property and the powers that property owners have, these um, are much broader. Tara mentioned the right to profit. That's an insane thing to think about. Um, but in California, at least, it runs deep enough that even if a property is rent controlled or rent stabilized, the landlord, if they feel like they're not making enough money, can apply to become exempt from this regulation, all based on whether the landlord believes they're making enough money off of this investment, off of this commodity. Um, eviction, as we mentioned, even with the strongest protections that the tenant movement, um, you know, can can fight for or that we have so far, landlords can still evict for many reasons and will often find a reason or create a reason to do so, as I'm sure we all know. Um, and then I just wanted to flag this bigger idea of control over the property. The landlord or the property owner is the person who decides um, whether to invest in the property, whether to maintain it, whether to keep it in good condition. And also, of course, they have um, access to the home as well, which can in some cases be dangerous, um, depending on who your landlord is. Um, but this idea that the even without these sort of legal protections, the power imbalance is inherent to the landlord tenant relationship because the decisions that the landlord makes impact our most fundamental living conditions, um, our safety, our ability to just have a normal day. Um, so this is really important. And yet landlords are so unregulated and so unmonitored. Um, you don't need any vetting or any licensing or anything like that um, to wield this kind of power over other people's living conditions. We don't know what property owners are up to a lot of the time. In Los Angeles, we're actually not allowed to know as the public um, who owns a property. So that's something that we work on a lot. Um, so there's an enormous amount of power and discretion that is left up to the property owner, even though the person impacted is actually the tenant. And um, yeah. I was gonna say first, actually, sorry, that um, you can imagine that the way that this plays out in court when there's an eviction case is similarly really, really imbalanced um, in favor of the landlord. And I can speak to California 
tenants have an extremely short turnaround to respond to an eviction in exactly the right way. Um, otherwise, they can lose their homes automatically. And uh, in general, probably if you've ever done court watch, you know this as well, but judges are not friendly to tenants. They believe the landlords. They just want to sweep the tenant through, get to the next one. They feel like it's their job to solve the problem that the landlord is having with their investment, protect the landlord's money, basically. And so I think, you know, one way to think about why things are like this is that we live under landlord rule. And I can say that in California, over a quarter of our state legislators are landlords. Um, this is our uh, speaker, Anthony Rendon, uh, a landlord as well. And um, of course, not to mention our national federal government, we are literally being ruled by slumlords and um, racist developers. So you can imagine how this plays out, um, that this would only reinforce this power imbalance. Um, and I do want to shout out the LA Tenants Union, who will, as you know, be speaking later, for doing a lot to position tenants as a political block in Los Angeles, um, someone that has to be paid attention to community members who do care about their homes and their neighborhoods and have a stake and will fight for them. So um, it may not be surprising that the landlords in power um, sponsor and forward politics that are designed to make money for landlords and developers. Um, and the YIMBY movement has been a particularly successful example of this. I'm not sure how familiar people are with YIMBY. It stands for Yes in My Backyard, as in um, build wherever. Um, and I have on the screen this uh, sort of, you know, tongue in cheek uh, quote that whatever the problem development is the solution. This is basically what the Yimbies espouse. Um, it started in the Bay Area. It was funded by tech and real estate money. Um, and the goal was basically to put a white millennial yuppie hipster face on the on Reaganomics and the idea that more unregulated development is the only answer to housing affordability. So they use a lot of progressive language, but ultimately they are pushing for free market deregulation, trickle down um, supply side uh, theories. So the idea that if you build any housing, no matter who it's for, even if it's luxury, most expensive possible, um, ultimately everyone will benefit from this over time, over who knows how much time. So that's EMBs. Um, and <laughs> of course, if you are going to try to develop anywhere as quickly as possible, you're going to go where the land is cheap. And because of a long history that Tara referenced and that we're not going to fully unpack today, but um, a long history of devaluing, um, disinvesting from communities of color, a history of redlining and distributing funds based on racial composition of a neighborhood. Um, what this means is that that land, the development opportunities are in the poorer neighborhoods, the communities of color. Um, so this is a model that is literally gentrification. Um, it is, as we know, gentrification itself is dispossession, displacement, um, sometimes even death for people who are impacted. We've certainly seen that. And if you look at who is evicted, and who is harassed by their landlords. It's women of color, and in particular, black women. And we actually worked on a report that found uh, in the Bay Area that uh, black people were 300% overrepresented in evictions. That's enormous, um, and that's the pattern. Uh, we're also seeing increasingly how just how clearly and explicitly policing is being used to, quote, clear the way 
for real estate development. And I think this really resonates here today because Breonna Taylor's murder was one of the clearest and most horrific manifestations of this that we have seen. In Los Angeles, uh, thanks to groups like Stop LAPD Spying, who we've worked with, and many others, we know for a fact that um, police and city officials collaborate on programs that are designed to remove poor people of color from an area and make it safe for rich white investment. Um, it's explicit, <laughs> like uh, it's a conspiracy, <laughs> basically. Um, and I think, yeah, this is crucial. So this model is that the very banks and financiers and developers who first gutted these neighborhoods and disinvested from them are now getting to own them and kick out the people who have made their homes there, um, who they initially wanted to contain there, right? So where are people going to go? Um, so I've presented, I think, a little bit of a quandary, and I think now we're going to turn to answering some of these questions and talking about um, the avenues to change that we believe in, that others have espoused as well, that some of our partners, like where we differ from people. Um, and uh, I think Tara will start us off talking about that. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Um, if we want to go to the next slide, um, I am going to talk briefly about um, Wall Street landlords as a uh, another threat to community control of housing. Um, so I'm assuming folks on this call have, have heard the term Wall Street landlord, um, but basically since the housing crash of 2008, um, Wall Street has been able to buy up huge swaths of housing all over the country and rent it out. Um, in the beginning, this was driven by companies like Blackstone, um, but as this becomes more normalized practice, we're seeing smaller owners grow their empires and acquire hundreds of properties um, across LA. Um, this map that we have here is a map of all the properties that um, corporate, the main corporate entities own in California. Um, so you can see it's like extremely extensive. Um, and uh, in LA also, uh, we found that the neighborhoods that are most financially vulnerable during COVID times um, are also neighborhoods that were seeing huge, acqui huge acquisitions by corporate entities. So why does this matter for tenants? Corporate landlords uh, use different tactics. Some seek out buying housing that isn't rent controlled meaning they can and do give huge rent increases on a regular basis. Some buy up rent controlled housing um, and convert it to condos, kicking all the tenants out as they do that. Um, in all cases though, tenants are paying rent to an entity that doesn't know them, doesn't know their community, and has only their shareholders in mind in their business practices. Uh, in 2017, Blackstone owned 82,000 properties nationwide and controlled 45%, almost half of corporate owned single family homes across the country. That's one company. Um, so this is a big challenge that we, had ahead, that we have ahead of us, but it also presents a potential for organizing. If 82,000 of us across the country have the same landlord and we can connect and organize, that's a huge opportunity to build tenant power. One barrier to this that Alana mentioned already is that a lot of property gets registered under an LLC or a limited liability corporation, which lets the real person who owns and controls the property like hide behind that. So um, one thing the, ma the mapping project has been working on is um, building a tool called a Victor book, which would let a tenant look up a property's real owner and see other information about the building um, as, as a tool to organize. Um, because if you don't know your target, you, you don't know um, how to put pressure on them. So um, that's just a little bit about the current, one of the current huge things that we're facing. Um, and I think root cause is also looking into what this looks like in Louisville. Um, but as Alana mentioned, we wanna move into talking about um, theories of change. Um, and the final, ch uh, 
the um or yeah i'm actually going to hand it back to alana to talk about this yeah um so i have on the screen three different um ideas or theories um, uh, about change. And I just want to say the tenant movement in California does include all of these and probably more. Um, so we have policy advocacy, we have service delivery, and then organizing. Um, and so there is value to each of these, um, but there are also some limitations. And I want to talk about why we devote our energy to organizing and to movement and solidarity research. So with policy advocacy, um, policy change is about you know, getting those legal protections like the ones that I talked about earlier, getting rent control, getting just cause. This can obviously be important, um, but there are serious limitations to this uh, strategy as a sort of transformative uh, method. Um, for one, when you're working with policymakers, legislators, politicians, there can be a lot of pressure to weaken your demands and to think smaller. Um, so this is a picture of LA's Right to Counsel Coalition um, trying to guarantee an attorney for all tenants facing eviction. This is a great goal and it has already been implemented in New York. So I'm this is no shade to Right to Counsel. Um, but we've seen as the process has moved forward that there were demands for carve outs from the very beginning people that the state didn't want to include in um, didn't want to grant this right to and the problem i guess is that when the state is willing to help anybody they definitely don't want to help everybody they only want to help the people that they deem deserving and that can be a real problem because we believe that everybody deserves housing right so they are the result of this is pitting people against each other who really in reality have a natural solidarity of struggling toward housing and that um, is not productive to the future that we want um, another thing about policy advocacy and another example i can give from california we have had several different um, so-called eviction moratoriums that were designed to provide relief for tenants during COVID-19. Um, even the strongest of these, it was confusing. It put the burden on tenants to get together a lot of paperwork without making mistakes. Tenants had to sort of opt in to the protection um, by following these strict steps. And after all of that, the landlord was still allowed to file an eviction. Uh, and the tenant could only use it as a defense once they made it to court. There was no regulation on the landlord, on the landlord's activities, no consequence for what the landlord did. It was all on the tenant. And I think this speaks to the fact that even though policy sounds like something overarching and um, that affects the collective, you could say, it actually often really focuses on the individual, really, um, uh turns these problems into uh or frames these problems as um individual problems that can be solved at the individual level and as tara and we have been trying to point out that is not the reality this is a collective issue um and that brings me to service delivery which i think has a lot of the same issues um so this is like immediate aid immediate assistance things like rental assistance or even maybe legal advice um so again there are carve outs again there are limitations because a service organization may be taking donor funds or maybe taking public funds they may be limited to the activities um, in their contracts and not able to expand their scope um, and if there are indeed these carve outs and limitations on who can be served, then the people who need it the most might not be served. The people that the state considers undeserving. And again, service delivery, of course, it's important. People need help now. That is not debatable. But the, uh, the scope of the work here um, the imagination available in the work here is again targeted at the individual household like it's their problem it's sometimes even it comes off like it's their fault um, one example 
that I hate is like financial literacy programs as a supposed solution to poverty, right? I think we all can agree that global poverty does not exist because some people don't know how to balance a budget, right? So we need to understand these issues as structural. We need to understand them as being connected and historical. Um, and often in the service delivery sphere, there's not even a desire to think that big because they rely on relationships with officials, with funders, and they're hesitant to jeopardize the work that they're doing and the funding that they're getting because it is urgent work. But the problem is when it's done at the expense of a radical political analysis and at the expense of building collective power. Um, we need to dream bigger than this, and we're going to talk about several ways that the LA Tenants Union and the Mapping Project try to do that. You're on mute, Tara. I think we're going to talk about this after Sasha talks. So um, the final theory of change we want to talk about really is organizing and, and, and movement building, um, which I'm going to hand to Sasha to talk about because the Los Angeles Tenants Union leads that work in LA for sure. Um, but before I do, uh, I'm going to play another clip from Sally about being what being part of the union has been like for her. Yeah. All right. Some of these people have already been past what you're going through now, Sally, and they're still sitting here. And Olga, one of them, we go together. She's already done the fight. She she doesn't want anybody to feel like she felt. Yeah. And I just love her for that because we could be angry and say, well, why should we care? Mm -hmm. We don't need to come anymore. No, no. You give it forward. You give it to the next person. You can say, look, I'm, I survived. Mm -hmm. I'm still here. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to help you. I know what to do. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody should be doing. Mm -hmm. That's what your neighbors used to do. And that's what the union makes me feel like when I was growing up and, you know, the lady next door didn't have tomato sauce. Here, go take that. Go take that to our neighbor. She needs it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And you learn. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we're learning again to reconnect mm -hmm. to our community, not just our neighbor. Mm -hmm. I love that clip. Every time I hear it, I'm just like so happy. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, kick it to Sasha. Awesome. Um, Talk about the Tenants Union. Great. Um, yeah, so I couldn't think of a better transition than Sally's own experience as a tenant who stuck around, joined the Tenants Union, and fought um, for her right to stay in her building where she still lives. So like I said, my name's Sasha. Um, I'm a member of the Los Angeles Tenants Union, and I'll try to give you an idea of how we got started, what we do, how we're organized, and how we're continuing our work um, during the COVID-19 crisis. So first, um, I think it really helps to conceptualize or think about the people power that's developed in a tenants union as a really long process. Um, and to do that, you start by listening, and then you build, and then you organize. And the LA Tenants Union, or Law 2, um, was founded in 2015, kind of through thinking through those actions. Um, the union's origins were really in a listening exercise in October of 2012. Um, and it started with a study group called School of Echoes, which is made up of organizers, educators, researchers, and artists, who launched a community-based research project into gentrification in Los Angeles namely its causes, its effects, and the forms of resistance that tenants were taking into their hands. And the questions that they studied revolved around what are you hearing in your neighborhood, what struggles are taking place around you, um, and really what does your community need, and finally how can we learn from and support one another. And um, let's see. Here you can see one of the very first meetings um, where those questions are really kind of being taken up in a public forum amongst community members. So next the question was, how can we mobilize around what tenants across Los Angeles are learning about gentrification and displacement from their own lived experience? How do we build a movement? And so they began to hold a series of tenants rights workshops in the spring of 2015. 
the group learned immediately through those workshops and through the folks that they met um, that without the context of a tenants movement, individual tenants have a really hard time realizing their rights and understanding how to really leverage them. Um, especially given issues like racism, language discrimination, immigration status, and poverty, which are all huge barriers to really demanding more rights than the few crumbs, like Alana described, that we have in California for tenants. Um, and so they learned that tenant landlord law largely favors property rights, as Tara and Alana described, I think, really well. Um, and so landlords are empowered, right? Tenants don't typically feel empowered. Um, and so the group also understood that it's no mistake that these laws are confusing to tenants, right? So eviction notices are notoriously intimidating and difficult to answer correctly, um, meaning that many tenants who receive them voluntarily leave their home even when the notice might be unlawful or they might have had a chance to win in court. So to expand our rights as tenants, we really need a movement. Tenants need a union. So over the next few years, tenants across the city found that they had no choice but to unite with their neighbors to resist evictions, rent increases, and habitability issues. And the next step for these isolated groups of tenants would be really to come together and see that the underlying conditions that were common to each of their struggles could be the groundwork for a movement. So these tenant struggles were taking place across the city in Boyle Heights, in Hollywood, and on Crenshaw. And all of these folks came together through School of Echoes, through that group that I first talked about in July of 2015 for a town hall on tenant struggles and what would come next for LA's burgeoning tenant movement. And the group began to form committees and started to meet twice a month. Uh, so the LA Tenants Union was born through that. And as Latu formalized into a movement, the group faced some questions. How do we define our work? How do we make decisions? And who's in charge? So one of the first things we did was so obvious that we almost missed it, um, but it was important and it would really shape the way that we organize. We had to define what exactly a tenant is. So we adopted the definition of tenant as anyone who does not control their own housing. That includes students in dormitories, folks who live with their parents because they can't afford to move out, senior care tenants, incarcerated folks, section eight and public housing residents, of course, boarding house tenants and unhoused tenants. And the reasoning behind this is to really pose a challenge to the capitalist property relations at large, rather than to focus on just the renter to landlord relationship. And this broad definition sheds light on the vast variety of ways in which housing insecurity really manifests and suggests that only a mass broad-based movement can mount a challenge to the commodification of housing, which is really what we're up against. So we also adopted the notion that we're not a tenants movement, uh, or sorry, <laughs> that we're a tenants movement, not a housing movement, um, and that what's often called a housing crisis is actually a crisis of tenancy. So this definition also suggests that a tenants union would have to be deeply rooted in communities of tenants in individual neighborhoods. And the movement would have to be led by the communities themselves and would address the specific histories and ongoing struggles in those neighborhoods um, that those communities call home. So this gave way to LATU's decentralized organizing structure. Um, instead of just a single entity that attempts to represent all of the many diverse tenant struggles across the enormous city of Los Angeles, we're actually made up of an ever-growing list of local chapters in neighborhoods across the city. So far we have 15 and we're growing, it feels like every single day. Um, decisions are made within these locals, not by any centralized committee, and each local meets twice a month typically, um, but most of them have actually been meeting weekly during the pandemic. And so here in these photos, you can see some of our first locals at their regular meetings. Um, and so these locals would also be responsible for following the union's community guidelines, for building up their own membership, staging community events like workshops and marches, and supporting their members with direct action, which is really the way that we're visible in the public eye. Um, and I'll come back to these different elements later when I talk about um, what a tenants union does. But first, I'll talk about LATU's core principles, which are political autonomy, horizontalism, and solidarity. So what do we mean by political autonomy? It kind of means a few things. Um, but most of all, it's important that none of us are getting paid for this work. Um, and you'll kind of see how, how that really distributes the power um, throughout the union and makes sure that each of us feels empowered um, to play an active role in the union. 
So we see our work as being embedded in an everyday practice of neighborliness or of solidarity, really. Um, and because of that, the only financial exchange that occurs is dues that we each pay. Um, and those range on a sliding scale between $1 and $5 a month. And those modest dues um, really help to pay for renting space to meet, for printing costs, um, buying food for meetings, and direct support for our members um, when they're really in crisis. And lately, many of our locals have been using their budgets to distribute food in their neighborhoods while doing outreach and empowering fo folks to assert their rights as tenants and, of course, to join our movement. Um, <clears throat> And since we're able to fund the union ourselves, we can remain independent from private donors, politicians, foundations, and agencies. So pretty early on, we decided that we wouldn't become a nonprofit. Um, and there was a lot of careful consideration around that decision. We have no board of directors, no executive directors, and no paid staff. None of us are getting paid to do what we do. We're simply neighbors helping one another. And we would not accept money from large foundations or from the city. We don't apply for grants or anything like that. Rather, we would fund ourselves entirely through our monthly dues. And that means that we don't have to bend to the political will of any of these groups, right? We don't owe anyone any favors. We don't have to pursue legislative strategies just because some private donor might expect us to. Um, and so that really allows us to remain politically autonomous, to organize the way that we want, um, the way that we feel is right for us, and to always take the most radical path. And so pretty central to our philosophy is the notion that it's only through exercising grassroots community power that we can get what we need. Um, and that doesn't come from asking politicians to give us breadcrumbs or for advocating for legislation necessarily, um, because those will always be compromises, like the carve outs that Alana was talking about. Rather, we intend to, fo to force the hand of these politicians through our direct action. Um, and our definition of tenant power really comes from the notions of community defense and self-determination, um, which will never come through legislation. And so um, we don't have any figureheads. Um, we see ourselves as a leaderful movement, meaning that we distribute power horizontal horizontally instead of through a hierarchy. So everyone in the union has the potential and freedom to step up into leadership roles. Um, and this really stems from an understanding that systems of hierarchy create power dynamics that are kind of antithetical to the kind of movement that we wanna build and the kind of fundamental solidarity that we believe in. And similarly, we're committed to solidarity and mutual aid practices. Um, that means that we're not a service provider and we don't host legal clinics or anything like that. Um, and what that means really is that we actively try to dispel the idea that you come to us with a question, we answer your question, and your problem is fixed, and we never see you again, right? That's service provision. Um, and the reason we work that way is that gentrification, systemic displacement, mass evictions, and high runs will never be solved through individual service provision. Service provision is basically a band-aid, right, or a temporary solution. Um, but what we really are trying to do is to build a movement to mount a challenge to these structural issues, which we um, are very adamant to say that these are not individual problems and that many more tenants than we, than we realize are really in this struggle um, together. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So um, what we try to foster really is an environment of neighbors that support one another. Um, and that starts with learning your rights and uniting with other tenants from across the neighborhood to fight and expand those rights. And after all of this, you might rightfully still be wondering, what does a tenants union do? Like, what, what do the mechanics of day-to-day -day tenant organizing look like? And what does it mean to be a member? Um, and so I can kind of lay out a spectrum of actions that we take or tactics that we employ, um, understanding that climbing up in the scale of these actions requires building capacity. So the sort of base level um, intro <laughs> to tenant power um, would be learning your rights. Um, and then very quickly, you'll understand that they are never enough. And this is the first step for any tenant in becoming empowered um, and being able to advocate for themselves, for their neighbors, um, and for their community and demanding more rights. And the way that a tenants union can facilitate that is by hosting tenants' rights workshops as a form of outreach. Um, whether it's an independent event or an info table that's set up in a public space, 
or at a community gathering. Oops. Um, it can also take the form of a neighborhood march that gets the word out about your work, handing out Know Your Rights flyers to folks that are st stopped at traffic lights, um, or meeting people outside of grocery stores and inviting them to meetings. Um, second, a tenants union provides a community space where tenants provide each other with emotional support and collectively strategize how to address tenant crises using organizing strategies. And you can do that by holding community meetings that are open to the public, um, which we really see as having the potential to become the civic spaces that American towns and cities are lacking. Um, and each of our spaces, or, or each of our locals in the Tenants Union meets in a community space in their neighborhoods, um, such as a library or community art gallery at least twice a month. And these meetings generally center tenants in crisis um, who will come to the meeting with an issue that they're facing, such as landlord harassment, disrepair, rent hikes, or eviction notices. And we make it clear right away that we're not lawyers here to provide legal advice. Um, and from there, we collectively workshop what the tenants' options might be um, and how the whole group can really support them in their struggle to keep their home safe, um, affordable, and habitable. Um, and I'll talk about our tactics and kind of where we go from there in supporting tenants um, in a little bit. Um, but typically at the end of the meeting, one or two people from the meeting will follow up with the tenant. Um, and then ideally the tenant will become a full-fledged member of the tenants union and in the future sort of pay it forward. Um, so as far as actually tackling uh, a tenant to landlord struggle head on, um, the first step is really, um, realizing that a tenant is much more empowered to assert their rights in the context of a tenants union. So landlords assume that tenants don't know their rights and won't advocate for themselves. So often the first step that we'll take is um, writing a demand letter to a landlord on union letterhead. Um, and often we'll deliver that demand letter with kind of a small delegation of members from the tenants union as a first sort of initial show of force. Um, and then from there, we'll, we have a kind of number of escalating uh, tactics that we'll use. So probably the most subtle that we do is a phone zap um, where we ask the public and our 2000 members to call a particular landlord and read a list of demands on behalf of the tenant that's facing these issues. Um, we'll also call for a boycott of the landlord's businesses and kind of picket outside of the businesses. We'll hold public marches to gather community support and really let a neighborhood know what one of their neighbors is going through. Um, and that often results in a lot of, um, yeah, kind of additional support uh, that the tenant can get from their immediate neighbors. We'll mobilize our press contacts to put pressure on the landlord through the media. And we'll protest at the landlord's mansion, um, sometimes even sleeping overnight in a tent to, sh to really make visible that eviction to housing and security pipeline that the tenant or, or that the landlord is really engaging. Um, and then of course we have our more extreme but often necessary forms of direct action, such as um, a community of tenants that are organized in a building collectively withholding rent in a rent strike until their demands are met. Um, and also resisting evictions through blockades. And a tenants union can even build towards doing building occupations, something that we haven't yet done in law to, but you know, is definitely uh, on the horizon. Um, and all of these really have the goal of getting the landlord to the bargaining table, um, where tenants will have the support of the union in negotiating their rent um, when it's about to be jacked up in asserting the right to stay in their homes when they're threatened with eviction and so on. Um, and again, landlords are really used to tenants who don't know their rights. Um, so much of what they do when it, uh, to sort of harass a tenant into moving out is illegal. Um, and when tenants know their rights and raise even a little noise, the landlord is already caught off guard. But with a whole union, we can raise hell and the landlord is suddenly facing a years long legal battle over a few thousand dollars that they might make from raising the rent. And they're kind of forced to consider whether that's worth it for them. And so you might still be wondering, what does a tenants union look like? Like, how do you guys actually organize? How do you communicate? Um, so I'll kind of uh, use this sort of scientific diagram of how uh, LATU is organized. 
Um, so we're kind of looking through a magnifying glass at sort of a cel cellular organism. And you can think of these little dark dots as individual tenants. So we're kind of taking it back to the level of an individual tenant and looking at how they can collectivize with their neighbors, their neighborhood, their city, and eventually potentially kind of a continental scale or global movement um, of tenants. Um, so imagine that these little dark spots are neighbors. It all begins with those neighbors talking to each other, um, getting all of their neighbors on a text thread, for instance. Um, and this might take the form of tenants in a single building, which is probably the most common way that we organize. Um, and they'll form what we call a tenants association. So you can see that those tenants are no longer alone. They've collectivized. Um, and those tenants can also form block committees, which are um, one of our locals organizes that way, where um, we form connections between buildings that are directly next to one another. And that can really lay the groundwork for um, a rapid response thread, right? So if one of the neighbors is experiencing any kind of crisis, whether it's um, emotional or mental health or even medical crisis, um, they can, they, they'll be able to call folks who are right around the corner. Um, it also lays the groundwork for community alternatives to 911. Um, so really building neighborhood support um, to build those cop-free neighborhoods that we mentioned earlier. Um, and really lays the groundwork for a more vibrant supportive neighborhood or a stoop culture where folks really know one another. Um, and so those TAs and block committees in a neighborhood come together to form a neighborhood assembly or really what in the LA Tenants Union we call a local chapter. And so that's kind of the cell here that all those tenants associations are, um, where they're kind of coming together to share updates on their struggles and supporting one another. Oops. So <laughs> once we start uh, zooming out and kind of putting down our magnifying glass, we'll see that the neighborhood assembly actually makes up just one local chapter of a citywide union. Um, and that really allows the neighborhoods to multiply their power and to learn about and support the wide range of tenant struggles that are taking place across the city. Um, and really to strengthen and unify the demands across the citywide tenants movement. Um, and in law two, our citywide union has committees that are kind of sinew or glue. And those are these sort of um, purple star shaped things that really hold the union together. So we have a, a committee for dealing with our finances. Um, we also have a committee that deals with media, which kind of act as press liaisons, as well as running social media, and they write, design, and photograph and film for the union. We also have an outreach committee, which oversees union-wide events um, and helps found new local chapters, as well as building relationships with other movements. And lastly, we have a language justice committee, which provides Spanish to English interpretation and translation for each of the locals and helps us maintain fully bilingual spaces. And so if we zoom out even more, we'll see that through our outreach committee, um, our union actually helped found what's called the Autonomous Tenants Union Network. And that's sort of a union of tenants unions. It's a resource for new tenants unions that are just getting started, um, as well as a space for tenants from across Canada and the US to share strategies and sometimes even hold concurrent actions. So five years might not seem like that much, but it feels like quite a long history that we've learned a lot from already. Um, and it's important that, to note that none of this was easy, nothing that we've won, um, none of our growth, uh, you know, the formation of all those chapters, it's really hard work. Um, it beats you down, <laughs> sometimes it's discouraging, um, but it's worth it. Um, and so the few victories that we can claim did not come without a fight. The spread of organized tenant power has only reemerged in the US in the past 10 years. So there's not a ton of precedent for what we're doing, though that's not to deny all the important work that's happened in the past century or so in the US. Um, and you know what that really means is the laws are not on our side. And even the public will take a lot of convincing to buy into our basic principles, which are really that no one deserves to be without housing simply for being poor. Um, and so we've learned some really important lessons along the way starting with um, the Marmion Royale Tenants Association in September of 2016, which you see in this photo here. So immediately upon forming in September of 2016, the, North the Northeast local um, organized to support 
the Marmion Royale Tenants Association, which had gone on rent strike that May to fight against unfair rent increases in an apartment building that was poorly managed um, and had racist management. So while some tenants of the building won settlements as a result of the strike, no one was able to stay in the building. Um, and so that's, to us, that's kind of really what we want. We want people to be able to stay. And so this experience was really an important lesson for LATU, um, one on the necessity of uh, LATU centering the tenants in the organizing and not the lawyers, um, and the need to build larger community support, doing outreach to neighboring buildings, um, and really making a show, or kind of laying the groundwork for a show of support from the neighborhood at large. So we've also learned from our victories, um, such as that of the Mariachi Crossing Tenants Association, which you see in this photo. Um, and so in April of 2017, the tenants of this building uh, launched a rent strike to resist unfair rent increases. And the strike was a huge success, um, resulting in rent rollbacks for the tenants, which is much more than we usually aim for. Um, so not only were they able to stay and have stabilized rents, um, their rents were actually lowered by the end of their fight. Um, and they're still living in their apartments today. And from this campaign, we learned the importance of broad community support and the strategic use of direct action against the owner, um, as well as supporting the tenant's own decision-making process, including the use of solidarity strikes among tenants who were not receiving the same rent increases um, and might not have, or might not seem like they have as much skin in the game. Um, and other victories that our members have won through organizing have been um, winning new building management that speaks the language that most of the tenants in the building speak, um, ending cash for keys offers, which are uh, when a landlord basically attempts to bribe a tenant into self-evicting. Um, tenants have won repairs. Uh, tenants have bought themselves time in their building by delaying its sale. And finally, and most importantly, tenants have built community through their organizing efforts. Um, neighbors who didn't know each other before, united in common struggle, and suddenly had that relationship. And so today, um, I guess I'll, I'll sort of wrap to talk a little bit about what we've been working on during COVID-19, which as we know is a very strange time, um, especially for work that relies so much on uh, kind of face-to-face -face relationship building. So during COVID, obviously tenants across Los Angeles, across California, across the US and the world have lost work. Um, tenants have been having to choose between food and rent. And so um, very early on, we took the position that when staying home is really our only prescription against COVID-19, we really see rent as nothing other than a fine for keeping ourselves, our families and our neighbors safe from a deadly pandemic. Um, so we launched our Food Not Rent campaign in April, asking tenants not to pay their rent and to instead organize with their neighbors and to join the tenants union. And so as a union, we're demanding the cancellation of all rent debt that's been accrued during the pandemic. And we very early on saw that elected officials would not be using their power to grant any real form of rent cancellation. We got some forms of rent relief that again, put the burden on the tenant to apply and that landlords could then reject. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're starting to engage in collective bargaining with landlords. So those tenants who have been organizing for months and withholding their rent, and luckily in California, we've had protections for them um, to be able to do that, are now negotiating with their landlords to cancel as much of that rent debt as they need. Um, and obviously with the backing of the union through pressure and um, kind of a show of force at these negotiating meetings. Um, meanwhile, we've also been forming a rapid response network ever since landlords started doing illegal lockouts in the spring, despite there being local and statewide bans on evictions in place. Um, and so what we would do at those um, lockout defense actions is we would show up in great numbers, helping tenants who are illegally evicted move back into their apartments and landlords were doing awful stuff. We helped one woman who had just been diagnosed with COVID. The landlord had ripped her toilet um, out and thrown it on the lawn as, a, along with all of her possessions um, and changed the locks. So we came with a solidarity locksmith, changed the lock back, um, moved her back in and made sure that she could shut the place. Um, and we see these actions as really a kind of practice for doing eviction blockades um, once evictions for missed rent payments become legal in the spring. 
We're also doing popular education through town halls in the Autonomous Tenants Union Network and through our social media, um, politicizing that rent debt that tenants have accrued, um, showing that tenants are withholding millions of dollars from real estate investment in Los Angeles alone. Um, and through this, we're really continuing the work that we've been doing for years, which is moving the conversation around capitalist property relations to the left and explaining what we really mean and what we need and want when we say housing should be recognized as a human right. Um, and what that is really is a world without landlords and a world without rent. Um, and I think with that, I'll, I'll wrap and pass it back to Tara. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so before we go back into, before we go into Q&A, um, since we're with Root Cause today, who is doing amazing work to build solidarity through their research, I just want to talk for a second about carving out spaces for research that are in solidarity with organizers and with the movement. Um, so much of what we're taught um, says that research or knowledge, which really just means investigation and meaning making, has to come from a university or accredited institution to be valid. And that's power that those institutions hold and wield. But what the mapping project has tried to do since its start is make a space where we're accountable to a different standard, where we're accountable to the movement and its needs. Um, this means that we ask different questions, we co-produce knowledge with organizations like LATU. It means that we produce knowledge that looks different than what would come out of a university. Um, and I want to be transparent, we have members of our collective who have a foot in academia, but we aim to redistribute the resources we gain there to different ends. Doing research in support of a movement also isn't just about what gets produced. It's about the process of learning together, of making meaning together, which is a crucial piece of movement building. And it's hopefully what we're doing today. Um, as a, a southerner, I grew up in North Carolina, I am particularly excited that um, Josh and others are building this work out from Root Cause uh, in, partner in, in partnership and in solidarity with organizers in Louisville um, and maybe in the future across the South. So with that, I'll hand it to Chanel who will get us into some Q&A.